All right. So here we see this story in Joshua chapter 9, of course, uh, just a real brief um, history bringing you up to, up to date. The children of Israel were led out free from, from the land of Egypt. Moses led them out, and they were going towards the promised land, the land of Canaan. And that is the land that, that God had promised unto Abraham. And he's finally bringing them out of Egypt with, a, with a, strong, a strong hand, a mighty arm. He brought them forth with all the plagues and all the miracles that he did. And now Joshua is leading the way. Moses was not allowed to, to lead the children of Israel all the way into the promised land because of the, the sin that he committed at the waters of Meribah. But um, now Joshua is leading the fight. He's leading the way in. And his charge from God was that they needed to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. And when you read through, like in the book of Le Leviticus, and the books of the law, when God's giving them all those laws and saying, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, you know, and, and then it gets to a point in Leviticus chapter 20, and it starts to get into some really weird things, you know, where it talks about the homosexuality and bestiality and all this other stuff, and you think like, God, why do you even have to tell us about this stuff? Like, it should be common sense that, of course, we're not supposed to do these things, right? Any normal person would think that way. But then you see it says, uh, all of the inhabitants of the land which are there before you did these things. So God's judgment, not only was God giving them the land that he had promised unto Abraham, the Bible is very clear to mention that it's not because you guys were so great that you're getting this land. It's given to them, one, by promise unto Abraham, because the children of Israel kept defying God. They were, that's why they're wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't have faith. I mean, they were, they were just stiff-necked and continually were murmuring and complaining. So he's like, look, you're not getting this land because you're just some great, awesome, righteous people. They're getting it because of the promise, but also because he was bringing his judgment upon an extremely wicked nation that, that had inhabited that land before. So he said, and this is why a lot of people don't understand, well, why did they have to kill them all? Kill all, you know, kill the, the, the babies, or kill everybody. And atheists will, will, will point to that and say, what kind of God do you serve? He believes in killing babies. Look, the judgment of the wickedness that had gotten to that point was justified by God. I mean, who are you to answer against God in the first place? But it's not that God is just some cold-hearted God, right? He's absolutely full of mercy and long-suffering. However, God has wrath too. And that is something that seems to be forgotten way too often. Is that, you know, people think they could, that God's just a, a, a furry teddy bear or something, and he's only always about love, and he doesn't have any judgment or justice or, or anything like that. And, and he does. The Lord's angry with the wicked every day. And when you push things too far, especially as an entire nation, when things just get way out of hand, God's judgment comes every single time. And don't think that America is any different. When this stuff happens, God's not a respecter of persons. You may have a great foundation. You may have had great ancestors. But if you turn and start doing the things, especially that we're seeing today and all the wickedness that's going on, God's judgment has to come. It's going to come. And that's what happened here. So Joshua was, was told, you need to, you're going to wipe out all the inhabitants of the land because one of the reasons is because he doesn't want them turning their heart away from serving the Lord. So as they started conquering people and defeating, you know, they defeated Og, the king of Bashan, and you know, he was of the, the um, some of the people that they, they defeated were like giants. They were defeating extremely powerful people countries. And the people around them started to see that here, this small group, they banded together. They saw they're like, well, we have no chance. They can see what's happening and they got afraid. So they're like, we need to do something so that we're not just destroyed. And I can understand that mindset too. I mean, you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure, hey, we don't want to be destroyed. So they, they come up with this plan and they send in an ambassador or a couple ambassadors saying, look, we're from a really far country. And they say, they brought all this real moldy, stale bread and the, and the wine in their bottles. Like everything just looked really old. Their clothing, the shoes were all real worn. And they, they put on basically a costume and an act to just to, to try to get them to not destroy them. And just and to make that league, make a pact with them, make an agreement saying that you won't destroy us, we won't destroy you. you know, we'll help each other out. 
and they say, you know, we heard about the Lord your God and we came all this way. We're your servants. We'll do whatever you say. And what I want to point out here is in verse number 14, because this is going to be all that just by way of introduction. Verse number 14, when they come to them and they know Joshua and, and, and the, the chief princes, the chief rulers, they know what God told them to do. So right off the bat, they're kind of like, well, wait a minute, you know, we can't just be going around making leagues with people because God told us to destroy everybody. What if you live among us and then we make a league with you? You know, we're not doing right by God. So they knew that that was at the forefront of their mind. But what happens? Look at verse number 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them. So Joshua trusted completely just on his sight, just on what he was able to see, and he was deceived. He relied completely on seeing their old moldy bread and their, and their shoes and the, the, you know, and the wine. And that's what made him make his decision. And he did not seek counsel counsel from the Lord. And what I'm preaching about this, this morning, the subject matter is seeking counsel. Seeking counsel, getting advice, going to someone for some advice on what you ought to do. Now, the Bible talks about this subject quite a bit. And too often times, we are not seeking godly counsel in the decisions that we make in our life. One, and this was a major problem for the children of Israel. They didn't seek counsel at God. They didn't go to God to see whether or not they should be doing this thing. Because this is something a little bit different. They didn't anticipate someone coming to them to make a league with them like this from a faraway country. They, are, they knew their plan to say, okay, well, we've got to destroy anyone. And if they knew that they were from the people among them, they wouldn't have made that league. They were clear on that. But when something else, a curveball came their way, something else came along, they didn't go and seek counsel from God. They just kind of relied on their own wisdom. Just relied on, their, well, I could see this and I could see that, so here's what I'm going to make. Instead of going to God to see the counsel. Now, too many times we think we know better or we think that we don't need any counsel. We don't need any guidance. We don't need to learn from anybody else or even ask anybody else. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So any fool is going to think, hey, everything I do is right. I mean, most people think, you know, everything, I'm always right. Everything I do is right. And I don't need to go ask anybody else about this problem because I know better. And it's kind of a proud attitude to have of just thinking that you just know what's right in every situation. Everything I do is right. It says, but he that hearkeneth on, if you listen to counsel, you listen to some advice, that's a wise thing to do. Don't think that you have the answers to everything. We need to be able to go and seek counsel and seek advice now, it, does, it also doesn't mean that you just do whatever other people tell you to do, but seeking counsel is just asking for that information, getting that, and saying, okay, well, what do you say? Now, the one case where we do do everything we're said to do is if it's, the counsel's coming directly from God. If it's coming from God's word, if it's there, just like with the children of Israel, hey, the, the commandment came from God, yes, that is what you do. You don't question that. You don't have to wonder, is that right? Now, if you go to man for counsel, if you go to a pastor, you go to a doctor, you go to anybody, I mean, anyone that you would go to seeking for advice in a matter, that, you know, obviously you have to question and see if that lines up with the Bible. But it's a good thing to seek counsel. As the Bible says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So again, we're seeing it's, it's a very good thing to seek counsel, to have people giving advice in your life. And when there's no counsel, that's where the people fall. When there's no one there to advise, you're, you're going to end up making a bad decision. But when you have a multitude of counselors, there's safety in that. When you could hear from, from, from different people, um, hopefully wise people. And then in Proverbs 15, verse 22, the Bible reads, Without counsel... Purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. So basically the same thing that we just saw in Proverbs 11. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Numbers 31. Just a few books, a couple books back in your Bible, Numbers chapter 31. 
Getting counsel or getting advice is very important. Uh, I'm going to quote again from Proverbs chapter 1. The Bible reads in verse 5, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So, someone who has some understanding, someone who already has a little bit of wisdom, is going to attain unto wise counsels. You're going to seek out somebody who's going to help you, give you even more wisdom, and give you godly, wise advice. Now, Notice we already saw a verse that said that there's safety to a multitude of counselors, not just one. And people have a tendency to fall into this trap. They get advice from somebody, and then they just do whatever that person says. And oftentimes, especially when someone's just really not, not grounded at all in, in whatever decision they're trying to make, they'll just take whatever someone else says, and then they have a, if, it, if it doesn't work out like what that person's advice was, then it's, oh, blame that person. They gave me bad advice. When ultimately, though, in all of our decisions, the responsibility lies on you. Right. In everything that you do and every decision that you make, that decision relies on you. So you want to make sure that you are getting the best counsel that you possibly can. And don't just rely on the words of one person. And look, I'll be honest with you, you know, I think going to a pastor or going to someone like that is a good source for getting counsel, but don't just rely on that one man here. Don't just rely on me. If you're looking for counsel or advice, I'd be happy to try to help you with that and give you some counsel and try to point you at Scripture and say, well, this is what the Bible says because that's the ultimate authority anyways is what the Bible says. This is the counsel. This is what God says. So here you go. But even that, you know, don't just always rely or do because what, what happens is and I don't do specific like counseling here. I, I never have, just I'll give everyone here a little update on the way that we run things here. I don't do closed door counseling. I do not put myself in a position where I'm going to be alone with, especially with a, with a female. Just we're just just me and that person is alone behind a closed door. The way that I will counsel people here is there, I will allow some privacy because some things you don't want to be talking about in front of everybody, but the amount of privacy it is would be in a room with other people where we're just maybe a little bit set apart but still in the same room. And also that um, there is nothing that has told me that my wife should not be able to hear. So if you, if you ever come to me and, and say anything to me, you better expect that my wife is also able to hear the same thing. Because I am not going to, because I don't want to hear things from people that, should, you know, that, that even my wife can't know. You know I don't want to hear that kind of thing. And usually with counseling, the other thing too, I also will not allow people to just start laying into or not, um, listing off all kinds of detail, graphic, sin and stuff like that. I don't need to hear that. You know, I'm, not, I'm not a confessional booth. If you need advice, I can help you with that. But there's some things that just don't need to be spoken out loud. Okay? And I am more than happy. I would love to help. If people have problems, I do want to help. So don't get me wrong on that. But it's going to be done appropriately and not just, you know, bearing all of your sins to some man. You can bear all of your sins unto God and he'll hear you for sure. If you need help with a specific problem, you can ask for some help, but I don't need a whole backstory. And see, oftentimes with counseling turns into, especially with marriage counseling, you got this person saying all these bad things about that person, this person saying all this. I don't want to hear all the different things that you think is wrong or bad with your spouse. I like to have a good view of everybody. I don't need to hear the dirty laundry being, being thrown up because none of that even matters anyways. People get focused on their problems and they think, well, because my wife doesn't make my food the right way or because my husband doesn't do this or doesn't do that, you know, like that that's the problem. And usually that's not the problem. The root goes down deeper. The, the source of the problem goes down deeper. And ultimately we need to be making sure, and my, God, my advice to anyone with marriage counseling is do what you can, do what God has told you to do in your role. We're too focused on the other spouse not doing what they're supposed to be doing and that becomes a big source of a problem. Say, so you know what? You can't control what the other person's going to do. Even if you're the husband, if you're the father, you're the head figure, you're the person that God has said, you are in the authority, you are the head of the household, 
Let me tell you what, guys, you still can't control what your wife does. She still has her own free will. Now, you are to be the leader. You are to be all the things that the Bible says. But at the end of the day, nobody can, can force other people to, to do things. You just can't do it. So what you need to do is say, well, may, and maybe it's true. Let's, say, let's just use that example. Let's say someone's wife is just not doing what they're supposed to be doing, according to the Bible. They're just not falling in their role. They're not doing what God has said. What you need to do is what you can to be the best husband that you can. You know, don't, don't get bitter against your wife. The Bible says to the husbands to love your wife, even as Christ loved the church. Try to be even better at your job of loving your wife. Try to be even better at your, at your role of leading. And a good leader isn't a dictator. It doesn't mean you don't have authority or anything else. A good leader leads by example. A good leader is able to show you, hey, I'm working really hard. And hopefully, and, and I believe this to be true, my wife has respect for me because she could see, okay, my husband's working very hard. He's working hard to put food on the table. He's working hard to support me. He's working hard to do all of these things for the family that God has told him that he's responsible for, and he's doing his job. He's not just wasting a bunch of time. He's not just going around and, and playing with, with friends or going out, you know, whatever, just doing things that don't matter. You can see the actual care and commitment there, and that will usually get through to the heart much better than just focusing on little things that people can do that are, that are, that are wrong. But anyways, that's, I don't want to get too far off into that. That's just an example of, of, of good counsel. The counsel is going to come from the Word of God and focusing in on what you can do and, and your jobs and your responsibilities and doing the best job that you can instead of focusing on other people's problems of what they're doing wrong. Now, I had you turn to pro, uh, Numbers chapter 31. Wow, oh yeah, okay, all of that came around from people just getting advice from one person and just doing what that one person says. I was trying to remember, how did I even get off on that, that rabbit trail? But be careful who your counselors are because there are a lot of bad counselors. Now, the Bible says that there's, you know, there's safety in a multitude of counselors, but we have to get wise counselors because you can have a whole multitude of counselors, but if they're all bad... That still isn't going to do you any good, right? Now, we're going to go through some examples here of bad counselors that if you're seeking advice, not to go to these people for advice. And there's a biblical example. So we're going to see the first one here in Numbers 31. Look at verse number 16. The Bible reads, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So the first source of bad counsel is from a false prophet. Balaam, the Bible refers to, is a false prophet. Now, if you're like, who is Balaam? I don't remember who Balaam is in the Bible. If you remember the story where the ass spoke, the donkey was, was like actually spoke with, with man's words and, and was audibly able to, to speak to a man, that was Balaam's ass that was speaking in that story. So that's who Balaam was. Balaam was a prophet, and he was hired by a king of one of the nations that the children of Israel were coming in to destroy, and he was hired by him in order to curse the children of Israel. And he's like, well, I know that whatever Balaam says, you know, it comes to pass or whatever. He said, he's, Balaam was a well-known guy. A well-known prophet, but he was a false prophet. And he was being hired by this king and saying, you know, come, come up here and, you know, curse the children of Israel for me because I don't, you know, I don't want to be taken over. I, you know, they need to be cursed. Now, God actually spoke to Balaam, though, and he said, you're not going to curse them. And he blessed them. And he hearkened unto God in that. But later on, you can see, and I, I've preached an entire sermon about this, about just about Balaam, the individual. And, um, how he was, he used enchantments, which enchantments are not of God, being like a, using sorcery or, or witchcraft. Balaam used that stuff. He was a false prophet. He's deemed a false prophet. You could read in Jude and 2 Peter chapter 2. I forget which one he's actually referred to in. Um, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 2. He's referred to as a false prophet. And we see here that he also, he caused the children of Israel to sin against God. Through his counsel. 
So he was giving the children of Israel advice, which was really bad advice, and he caused them to sin, and he caused them to, to commit fornication, and they were taking wives of the, stray, of the heathen women. And that was all based on the counsel of Balaam. Now, we need to be careful of the false prophets that are out there th these days. And the best, the best way to know, and here, you know, here's, I'll, I'll name the names. I'm not afraid of naming the names. I know the Apostle Paul named the names. But a real popular, common example of a false prophet is Joel Osteen. Okay, here's a man that's afraid to speak anything negative. Here's a man that is not even willing to say that there's only salvation through Jesus Christ. I have seen interviews with him where he's saying that basically, essentially people have their own ways and that God will look down on that and that's the truth that they have. And, and that's a false prophet. Okay, When you're not even willing to stand on the exclusivity of salvation being only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and being able to say, yes, if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell, you're a false prophet. He preaches for filthy lucre's sake. That's why he's a multimillionaire. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to offend anybody. So don't go buying his books and trying to get counsel from Joel Osteen. He's not going to lead you in the right path. It's not good counsel to get. And there's plenty of other false prophets, and I'm not going to get into all of them right now, but the, the first place to look for for a false prophet is their salvation doctrine. That is the number one place to start. If you're going to read anything from anybody, if you want to get advice from one of these famous pastors or whatever, what do they believe about salvation? Do they believe it's only by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And do they believe that it's eternally secure? You could never, ever lose that salvation? That's the place to start. Because if they don't believe that, I wouldn't listen to a word that they say. Right. It's bad counsel. Now, this may seem funny, but hopefully no one's involved in this. But another place, turn if you would to 1 Chronicles chapter number 10. And I guess it shouldn't seem too funny because the example we're going to look at is someone that did this. 1 Chronicles chapter 10. But a, another extremely bad source of advice is an astrologer or a palm reader or someone that's involved in witchcraft. Now, we can look at that and smile and say, yeah, of course, because it's silly. I would never do those things. It's ridiculous. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, we see a Christian that did that. We see a believer that actually went and did that, and that's King Saul. 1 Chronicles chapter number 10, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord, Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. That's pretty serious. He lost his life. God killed Saul. God made it so that Saul died. For two reasons, it says, because of the transgression here against the word of the Lord, which he didn't keep, and also for going to seek counsel from a witch, someone that had a familiar spirit. That... Came, that caused his demise. That caused his death. So we want to talk about how serious it is getting good counsel. Don't just because these people think that they oh I could, you know I could see the future. I'm going to look into my crystal ball. It may sound tempting when you have bad problems and you just need someone to help guide you and direct you and you start thinking, wow, maybe this mystical person, they have some extra knowledge that I don't have and they could see the future and they could read my palm and they, could, they know so much about me because of whatever reason that's completely ungodly and wicked. Don't get tempted by that. See, the reason why King Saul went to the witch is because God wasn't answering him. Because he was rebellious and stiff-necked and didn't obey God. And, and here's the thing. God's got all kinds of wisdom for us. And we ought to be going to God in prayer and asking for his, his advice. But as with King Saul, if you don't listen to what God's telling you to do, don't expect to really be hearing from him either. If... if you know, if, if I keep telling my daughters, okay, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, you know, it's the same thing, just over and over again. And it is, don't listen, don't listen, don't listen. And then they come to me for advice, maybe about something similar, about, oh, well, Dad, what should I do here? Why should I tell you anything? You haven't been listening to me this whole time. 
I, I, I've been telling you and telling you and telling you, you don't want to listen to my instruction. Now all of a sudden you're coming to me and you're asking for help? Just a little tip for your prayer life. You know, we have God's instruction here. God doesn't speak to us audibly. If you're hearing voices, you've got a different problem. Okay, God's not speaking to us and whispering in your ear. He has given us His words. We have instruction. We have godly wisdom and counsel at our fingertips. We need to be going to this for our solution. Now, again, seeking counsel outside of this and, and seeking godly counsel from men of understanding, people of understanding, that's great. It's nothing wrong with that. But if you are the type of person that goes through the Bible and you know that things are wrong, you know you shouldn't be doing something, but you just do them anyways, and you just don't seem to care that much. When you start having problems, if that's your attitude, you start to have problems, don't expect God to be the first one just to be helping you out of your problems. He's told you and you didn't want to listen. And, and you know, the problems you're going through then are probably a result of your sin anyways, but we need to be careful about that. The, the King Saul went and, and inquired of a witch. It's a bad counsel and it cost him his life. Psalm 1, you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to uh, Job 14. I want you to see Job 14. Psalm 1, 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Don't get advice from ungodly people. Don't go to them for your counsel. If you see someone, you know someone's a wicked person, don't go to that person for counsel or advice. They are not going to lead you in the right way. Seeking counsel is wise, but blindly doing what someone tells you to do is foolish. So again, it's very important that we get this nailed down. Going to someone and, and, and asking advice and getting counsel is great. First, it needs to be from the right people. Try to be careful who you're getting it from. But even if you feel comfortable with that person, don't just blindly accept whatever that person says. Now, Probably what's going through your mind as we talk about getting counsel from people, you're probably thinking of spiritual problems because we're sitting in church. Right? You're probably just thinking like, yeah, you know, when I have a problem with this, I have a problem with my wife, I have a problem with whatever kind of things are going on in my life. And everything I've said, yeah, I agree with that. That's great. You know, of course, we shouldn't go to bad counselors or anything like that. We shouldn't just blindly do what we're told. It all changes when we go into the medical realm for some reason. And I've been taught and brought this up from my birth. Well, the doctor said to do it, then you just do it. That is a dangerous, dangerous way to think. Yeah. Too many people are just will treat the word of the doctor as gospel truth. We have elevated the status of physicians these days who, by the way, are just men and women. They are imperfect people. They do not have all knowledge. Don't get too caught up in the pride and arrogancy of this world that thinks we are so smart these days and that scoffs at the people of the past. Ha, ha, ha. They were so stupid. You know what? People have been doing that all throughout history. Oh, yeah, the people before us, they were so dumb. Oh, they didn't know anything. And it doesn't take very much time to go back to even look at people and say, yeah, what we're doing there was wrong and dumb and completely false. But at the time, they tell you this is exactly what you need to do. Right. And, 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 and the doctors are being looked to, and, yes, this is what we need to do. This is the right thing to do. They could tell you with confidence. And you, know, you look at the person, they're wearing a different coat, and they've got a stethoscope around their neck. So I must just believe them because they're really smart, and I'm dumb, and they know what they're talking about. Not always. Now, look, this isn't to bash all physicians because it's not. There's plenty of physicians that are great physicians that actually can give you good advice on things. But the problem is when you just believe everything that they say without question, without doubt, without seeking other counselors, without anything like that, and you just believe whatever they say because they're a doctor, that's a problem. As we mentioned before, you know, when you're seeking godly counsel or wisdom from someone in a spiritual realm, 
We could say, oh, well, you could look at what they believe for salvation. We could see, are they even saved? Are they a false prophet? You know, one of the things that's going to be bad counsel, but with a doctor, how are you going to do that? It's going to be a little bit more difficult. You need to be able to um, judge whether or not the advice that you're getting is, is good or if it's bad counsel. We shouldn't be putting too much confidence in any man. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, and there's many physicians of no value out there. The Bible talks about physicians of no value. And it talks about, um, there's, there's stories that the Bible even brings up. There's the woman that, was, that had an issue of blood, remember, that was healed by Jesus Christ. It says, she was seen by all these doctors and, and, and spent all of her living trying to get better from her disease and say, she actually didn't get better, she got even worse when she went to those doctors. But then she went to Jesus and Jesus healed her. And that's where the good counsel was, was with Jesus. Now, again, just to clarify, I'm not one of these people that says, never go to a doctor under any, you know, and, and always just have faith and that that's all you need to do. I don't believe that. I think there is definitely value in physicians. And you know, Jesus Christ said that um, he that is uh, whole needeth not a physician, but he that is sick. Right? So when you are sick, there's a time to go to a physician. There's time to go to someone in an expertise where they, they know a little bit about the body and can help you make a good judgment call, a good decision for your health. But you have to be careful who you go to. Now, I do have a quick example here. I've already preached on this in the past of why you shouldn't just always do what the doctor says. An old example would be when they believed in bloodletting. And they would think that if you, you know, if you have a fever or whatever, you just let out the blood and that'll help you and that'll actually, you know, do good for you. But if you take the scriptural advice, you know, the, the life of the body is in the blood. You don't want to be losing the life. You don't want to just be letting out that blood. But they thought the doctors at that time would say, yes, this is the proper procedure. This is what this is going to help you. And it's bad counsel and it went against scripture. Something that's done even to this day, and I know it's controversial, but I don't care. I'm going to bring it up anyways because I'm going to preach the truth, and I believe this is truth. You're in Job 14, verse number 4. Job 14, verse number 4. The Bible reads, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The Bible teaches that you can't get something clean out of that which is inherently unclean. What we are taught today, what the medical world by and large is teaching, is you need to inject yourself with a disease in order not to get that disease. You want to be clean and healthy? Inject yourself with a disease. That goes against the biblical knowledge and the wisdom that God has given us. You can't get a clean thing out of an unclean. And look, you, talk to me after the service if you, if you have questions about this, because I've done a lot of the research outside of just the scriptural knowledge of showing that that's foolishness. But I'm talking about vaccines in case you didn't get it, okay? There's vaccines are being pushed on people for the flu, for polio, for all these things. And when you look at the research, when you look at what's happened, the vaccines have all been introduced, even the polio vaccine, because I know the propaganda machine was out there telling you that polio, the, the vaccine killed the disease. It's not true. It was already on the decline. You can see the charts from the CDC's website of the, the, the people that had the disease. It was the, the, just like every disease, every plague that goes through mankind, it, it it, it has basically kind of like a bell curve of the people that it affects and then it dies off and you kind of, you know, like the Black Plague, we don't see the Black Plague anymore. It's not because we have vaccines against it, it's because the disease ran its course and died out. And when you look at when the vaccines were introduced, it's always when they were already dying out on their own. But see, now you have a vaccine to say, well, see, we're taking the credit for this. And they cause damage. There's plenty of people that you, you're inject because you're not only are you injecting this disease, you're injecting all the other things in your body, the heavy metals, the thimerosal, the formaldehyde, whatever it is, the adjuvants are that they put into that to try to keep the disease, you know, from just completely rotting away, are harmful to your body and harmful to your system and can cause serious negative effects. Now. 
But that's an area, well, the doctor said so. Don't just do everything that they say. Do some research on your own. And thank God that we do live in an age now where we have a lot more information at our fingertips to kind of look into this a little bit more. Because ultimately, we are responsible for our own actions and, and the, th the, the decisions that we make. Now, maybe you're seeking counsel because of emotional problems or, or personal problems. You know, people go through depression and have, and have problems in their life where, where they feel like, well, I need help. And you, maybe you do need help. But again, be careful who you go to for your counselors. These psychiatrists and psychologists are bad counselors. They're going to you with the world's wisdom and they're going to treat you with the wisdom of the world and the vast majority of them will, will see the problem and it's just like most of the modern Western medical institution will teach you that, oh, the, problem to, or the solution to your problems is drugs. Take this pill, take that pill, take that pill. Oh, you're in pain, here's some drugs. Oh, you're feeling too sad, here's some drugs, they'll make you happy. Oh, you're feeling too happy, here's some drugs, they'll make you not so happy. Oh, you're feeling anxiety, here's some drugs, they'll help you with that. And it's this, this, this notion of just being able to take chemicals and introduce chemicals into your body that's going to solve your problems. Now, we need to make sure we're getting good advice. And, and the problem, I believe that the, one of the sources, one of the root problems with the whole incorrect view in the, in, the, in the medical field comes from the teaching and especially like in biology you know these, these doctors I believe these people are good intentioned people so I'm not just saying that these doctors are wicked right I'm not saying that they're out to hurt you I'm not saying that at all because I do honestly believe that they want to help you to the best that they know how the problem is the best they know how in many cases is false right. and it stems from the teaching that they receive and, and it, I think it boils all the way down to the evolutionary science that is taught and the understanding that we did not, we are not created beings, but that we evolved. So when you treat things that way, when, when you have the approach that everything happened by chance and that life just sprung out of non-life and that everything is just a sequence of reactions, is a sequence of chemical reactions with each other, when that is your mindset and that's how everything came to be, well, treating problems with chemicals makes sense. People that believe that, that who we are, that we don't even have a soul or a spirit, that it's really just electrical f impulses that are firing in your brain and that that is just basically what makes up who you are. There's nothing extra to that. It's just all physical then you're going to deal with all the problems or well, you have neurological problems or you just need to get this medicine that'll change the way that your brain functions and that that'll solve your problems. But see, that is fundamentally flawed. Right. And I think that is what steered science down the wrong path is that not having the proper foundation. When you realize, though, on the other hand, that God has designed our bodies... God created and had a plan and when he designed the organs and he designed the blood and the veins and the whole process, the way that our body works, the immune system, everything, God had a very, very good plan. And when you approach health in that way and say, how can I just help my body do its job even better? That, I believe that's going to give you the right um, results. And again, I'm not claiming to be a medical expert, but there are definitely some things that I know and I've seen that are false, and there's definitely counsel that is contrary to Scripture. And when you see things like people trying to bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing, oh, and by the way, about the vaccines, all of the most common vaccines, by the way, the measles, mumps, rubella, all, they're, they're all now created off of aborted fetuses, or whether it be human or animal. There are literally parts of dead babies that are used to culture the vaccines that are injected into your body. I don't know about you, but I'm not okay with that. Amen. I'm not okay. The ends do not justify the means. Right. I am not okay with that. And again, I've got all the information, but I probably still have it in my pulpit because I preached about that a few months ago. But um, if you want to see the actual facts about that, I'm not just coming up with this stuff off the top of my head, I'll give them, I'd be happy to give that to you after service. 
But let's continue on here. We've got a little bit more to go. Oh, one more point on getting counseled by many counselors, especially when it comes to the medical issues. It would be a good idea to get advice from people that will have a different solution to your problem and try to hear what other people have to say. For example, if you were to go to, if you have some kind of problem with your hand or your foot and you go to a surgeon to ask them to help you, what's going to be their solution? It's going to be surgery, right? I mean, that's what they do. That's what they specialize in. So they're going to be looking for solutions that they know how to fix. But if you go to a different type of physician or a different doctor, you know, but my point is go to these, especially in areas that maybe you are not very well knowledged in. You know, you go to a, a mechanic, right? If you don't know anything about cars, well, how you, you're going to have to trust somebody or something to help you out with that, right? You need to find a good counsel. But if you can get multiple counselors to try to help you with your problem, diagnose your problem, especially in the medical, because the medical, you, you, when you're talking about your body, that's important. It's important. I mean, you, we've only got one body in this lifetime. You know, praise God, we're going to get a new body one day, but right now we got to take the best care of this one that we can. So try to get the, the, as much um, you know, varying viewpoints as you can. And, um, I mean, talk to, the, talk to the medical doctor, talk to the naturopath, talk to the, you know, see, and then you decide what you think lines up as, as good counsel and as good wisdom. Um, turn, if you would, to Isaiah. Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Good counsel ultimately is going to come from the ultimate counselor whose name is counselor. Isaiah 9, 6, of course, very famous verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ's name is, one of his names is counselor. He's someone to go to for counsel, for advice, for instruction. He is the one, and, and obviously... Everything that we need to know can be found in this book. All of the, the, the important things about life can be found in this book and about health and about everything else that we need to know. What God says that we need to know we could find in this book. And we ought to be using the wisdom that's found in the pages of this book to guide our decision making. Isaiah 11 verse number 1. Again, referring to Jesus Christ, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. And it goes on and on. And I just wanted to point that out there in that verse 3 that we read. He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Remember, that's what Joshua did. Joshua judged just after the sight of his eyes. He didn't go to God. He didn't go to the counselor for his counsel. And I believe in all matters, no matter what your problem is, the first place you always should turn to is God. You have a medical problem. First place, turn to God. You have a, a, a spiritual problem. You have an you emotional problem. First place, turn to God. You have a problem with another person. First place, first person you turn to ought to be God. Go to God in your prayer. Bring your problems to Him. That is absolutely first and foremost. Go to the counselor, pray, ask him for wisdom, ask him for godly counsel. You know, lay it all out. God knows your heart, but lay it all out for him and say, God, I'm having this problem and, and, I, and I want this to be resolved. I want this to be fixed. And here's what I'm planning on doing, God. But God, please lead me and help me and give me the wisdom that I need to, to make the best decision that I can. And then you go out from there and you could seek other counselors and, and other people, especially people that have a godly wisdom or people that know their Bible well to try to help you. Maybe you missed something in your reading. Maybe you didn't hear the instruction that you needed before and someone else can help you and point you and say, oh yeah, so what you're looking for, you know, here's some scripture on that. Here's, here's what God's trying to tell you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings. We're almost done. 1 Kings and chapter 22. 
I'm going to read for you from 1 Kings chapter 12. Another good source for, uh, as a counselor, especially for the younger people, is to listen to the elders, to the older council. See, the Bible contains truth. We know that. The Bible is full of truth and wisdom. Everything in here is true. And there's two ways that you could learn this truth. You can either just get it straight from God's Word, from the Bible, or you can experience it. And you can go through it and then realize, hey, what the Bible said is true, right? It's better, at least for the, for the negative things, for the bad things that happen, for the warnings that we get here, to not have to go through those things in order to realize, yeah, that's actually a bad idea. Yeah, going out and partying and getting drunk, that's actually not a good idea. That's not going to bring me happiness and joy. Amen. Just get it from the Bible. You don't have to live through it in order to learn that lesson. Okay? But this is one of the reasons why listening to older people is still a good idea, a good source of counsel because they've been through a lot more. And I learn this more and more the older I get. I'm 39 years old right now. And the older I get, the more I realize, you know what? You do accumulate quite a bit of knowledge just over time. There's a lot of things that you, that you pick up over the years. Things that you see and it's experiential wisdom that you get. I'll read for you from 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 6. We see an example of this with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. It says, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do ye advise that I may answer his people? Now this was a good step for him because he's going to the old men. Now his father Solomon had all the great wisdom anyways that God had given him. And he's going to these old men that were, that were with him and surrounded by him and, and surrounded by good counsel. And his son goes, Okay, what do you guys have to say? Verse 7, And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. And that's great advice. Amen. He said, a good leader. Here's a young king. Here's a king. He's coming into power. He said, you know what? Be a servant to them. Be, lead by example. Show them what it means. Show them that you have a humble heart. Show them that you can be a servant, and the people will love you for that, and they'll serve you. Great advice. Verse number 8, But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young people, the men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's oil. And he goes on and on, just saying how much worse he's going to be. And here he is, he's getting counsel, he says, from the young men that grew up with him. Here's the spoiled little rich kid that grew up having everything, right? Because not only did Solomon have wisdom, but he had all the riches and stuff. So anything that his, he set his eyes on, he had. Rehoboam grew up like that. And all his young men that grew up like that, they didn't have to deal with hardship. They didn't really gain any experiential wisdom because they had everything that they needed. And instead of taking the counsel of the old men, which would have established his kingdom, he forsook it. And as a result, he lost it. Now we know, again, we know that the the cause ultimately was of God and that God was rending the kingdom from him. But here is still a good example of, of a decision that he had to make and he chose not to go with the good counsel and went with the poor counselors, with just the young counselors that didn't really know any better. A good counselor is someone that has wisdom. And obviously the best knowledge of wisdom that we get is from God's word. And a good counselor should be able to guide you and explain why. So when people, if you go to ask somebody, you know, what do you think I should do in this situation? The best counselor is going to be able to explain why you should do a certain thing. Not just say, well, just do this. Because the, you know, and hopefully it'll be with wisdom gained from the Bible. Uh, if you're in 1 Kings chapter 22, this is the last place we're going to look at this morning and we're done. 1 Kings chapter 22. First Kings chapter 22, verse number 5. We see here the story of King Jehoshaphat. Verse number 5 reads, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. See, what they're doing is they're about to go into battle. 
And King Ahab was the wicked king of Israel. But Jehoshaphat was a righteous king. He was a king of Judah. And before you're going into battle, Jehoshaphat's like, wait, 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 wait. Let's go and quite get God's counsel first. Before we go and get involved in this big battle, I want to hear from God. I want to see what God has to say about this. So look what it says, verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Joshua said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? I'll keep reading. I'll get to my point. And the king of Israel said unto Joshua, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joshua said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Joshua, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah, made him horns of iron, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, with these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of them, one of them, and speak that which is good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? There's so many great truths in this story that we can glean from this. The first is, if you just want to hear something, if you just want to have confirmation, like if you want to do something and you already think it's wrong, you already know it's wrong, and you're seeking counsel and you just want someone to confirm what you're doing, it's going to be easy to find that person. The king of Israel here had 400 supposed men of God. Right? They're supposed to be prophets. And they were all just yes men for the king. They were false prophets. They weren't saying the truth. And what's interesting here is that we see the king of Israel, you know, when, when Micaiah says, oh yeah, go, go ahead, go prosper. He's like, you know, how many times do I have to tell you, just tell me what's true and right? Which tells me that he already knew the answer. He already knew in his heart. And that's why he's rebuking him. He's saying, look, just tell me what's right. He had to tell him that, and then he's like, yeah, you're, you, you know, <laughs> you're going to die. It's, you, it's not good. You're not supposed to go and do this. You know, paraphrasing, obviously, what he said. That's what he said. And then he's just like, oh, yeah, see, he never says anything good. Now, I believe this, too. I think most people that are asking for counsel, and I know this myself when I've asked for counsel, usually deep down you know what the right answer is. Usually you already know and you're kind of looking for that extra confirmation. It's, again, it's good to seek counsel, but um, don't have this attitude when what you think is already right, but you didn't really want that answer. You're going to get the other answer. Like, no, this is actually, no. When you hear the answer, receive it. Then accept, obviously, this was from the Lord in this example. So in this case, you know, he, he needed to receive that that good godly counsel and said, see, oh yeah, he's never, he's never says anything good about me. Maybe it's because you're wicked, Ahab. Maybe it's because you're not following the Lord at all in any aspect of your life. But, you know, uh, he already knew that. We need to be able to seek the good counsel. Oftentimes the good godly counsel can be scary because it's not what the majority will tell you. Here, the majority of the people, 400 prophets, were saying one thing. And Micaiah said something different. But what Micaiah said was right. 
I, th I think I've thought about this many times in the past. Because oftentimes the right thing to do is not the popular thing to do. We know this. Uh, we know at least with doing righteousness, especially in a wicked world. But even not just talking about righteousness, talking about just making decisions that is going to have a big impact on your life. I think about now going back to a medical situation of the thought of like getting cancer. Okay, conventional wisdom and modern science today will tell you to have surgery and do chemo and, and treat things that way. And, and everything else is, is really discouraged of getting any other type of treatment. Now, I don't believe in those methods of treatment. I don't think you need a big bazooka of chemotherapy to destroy your body. I think we need to help the immune system. And I'm not going to get all into that, but it can be scary trying to make what you believe to be the right decision. And I'm not telling you what to do if you have cancer, okay? I'm just, this is my personal thought, things that I've had. I have the belief that those treatments actually kill the patients. I've seen too many people, I've seen family members go through that treatment where it literally destroys them and whittles them down to nothing. And I don't agree with those treatments. I think that's a bad treatment to go. And I, and conversely, I have talked to people so it's secondhand for me, but for, have had first-hand experience of taking alternative treatments and treating cancer that have successfully beat it and are completely cancer-free and are doing just great because they treated it in a more natural uh, way and in, in, um, in not destroying their bodies. Now, but the problem is when you, it's, it's, it's easy to make the decision when it doesn't happen to you, right? It's easy to, 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 to know right from wrong when it's somebody else. But for whatever reason, when we get stuck smack dab in the middle of a situation, all of a sudden you're like, oh man, what do I do now? And it could be scary to think, well, what's the best option? What should I be doing? And we have a tendency to want to fall back on just what's accepted. What's the, you know, what's the norm? So like if my wife were to come down with cancer or something, the... the the non-thinking easy route would be just do what the doctor says and just do, you know, just go through that and that might feel like the safe bet because, well, there's all these doctors that are saying to do this. This is what's accepted. The harder thing is going to be to say, well, you know what? No, I, I really don't think that's right. I'm going to have to go against the grain on this one and try to do something else. And it could be a little scary because ultimately it might just be a lack of faith or a lack of understanding that, that will make you scared. But we ought to, in those times when, when you do have to make those important decisions, if, it, if you feel like you know this is what's true, but it may not be popular, it's best to, to stick with that, with what the good godly counsel is and the good godly wisdom. And again, I'm not, I don't want to go into the whole cancer thing. That's a whole, a whole other thing, and that's, you know... I'll let you all just figure out for yourself what you believe about that and, and everything else. But um, to me, it's just a good example because so many people these days are, are facing that type of decision and being, and being confronted with these serious issues. And the, and the repercussions are serious too. So we ought not to just get too scared or to just blindly trust in a majority either. So when we, come, when we face these situations, hey, and if you think, you know what, that is the best way, then that's fine. You know, if, that, if, that's, if, you've, if you've been, if that's something that you think that like, no, that's right, and it, it does happen to be a majority, but they're right, great, but don't just blindly follow, is my point. Question it and say, is that really the truth? Is this really the best thing to do? Is this the best counsel that I could receive? And try to get as much counsel from other places. We're closed on this verse, Proverbs 27, 9. The Bible says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Now, I believe in, in, in the New Testament church, and our church here, that we are a church family, and that we ought to be here for each other as people who love God and want to serve God and want to know more and we study our Bibles, we ought to be here to help other church members out when they're in need and they're seeking counsel. Even just receiving hearty counsel here, it says, 
you know, the ointment and perfume, right? they're, they're, they're nice things, perfume, good smelling things. It says that rejoices the heart. It kind of makes you happy. It lifts your spirits a little bit. And it's, it's relating, receiving hearty counsel by it from a friend to getting that type of encouragement, that type of rejoicing. So we ought to make sure that we are there for other people to be able to provide that hearty counsel. Hardy means you care about the person. We all ought to care about the people. You know, we have these prayer requests. We have these prayer lists of the members of our church on there. Do you care about those people enough? And when you see somebody has a problem specifically on the prayer request, you know what? That's a good indication that they might need some counsel. They might need a friend to provide hearty counsel to keep that in mind as you see these people and maybe pay a little bit more attention and, and talk to these people specifically, whether they show up in church or even if not, if you, you know, if you know them well enough, you know where they live, to go call them up or visit them and say, hey, you know, how can I, how can I maybe help you? And don't just wait for people to come to you. Not everybody is going to come to you with their problems. Now we should. I think we should be able to seek out godly counsel. That's a good thing to do. But when you care about other people, your friends, your family, your church members here, you know, it's not a bad idea just to offer up and say, hey, I, I'm here to, to, to help out in any way I can. So uh, good, good counsel is good. And um, seeking counsel is great. Seek, seek many counselors. There's safety in that. But make sure you know where your counsel is coming from, that, it, that ultimately we're getting the, the truth and wisdom directly from God's Word. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great counsel and instruction you give us through your Word. Lord, I pray that you would please help us all as we deal with the, the different struggles and issues in our own personal lives, that you would help us to make the right decisions, dear Lord, that we would have good, godly counsel to instruct us and lead us and guide us, dear God. Help us to be a great encouragement unto others and that you would give us the wisdom that we could also impart unto others, dear Lord, that, that we can help out and, and truly um, be able to make the right choices. Lord, help us not to be fearful in making those right choices, but that you would um, comfort us and, and help us to understand the right ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.